I'm very much looking forward to this panel discussion with the three of you here. Um, and uh, to everyone watching, please feel free to leave us comments here. And also there's the question button. So we will also include some of your questions, of course. And um, yeah, why don't we start with a short presentation? Maybe, Steve, would you like to start? And also the topic of this panel discussion um, is unfamiliar writing systems when we're learning a language with unfamiliar writing systems. So maybe, Steve, we all know that you speak, I don't know how many languages, but many. <laughs> but Not can you right maybe here. also explain yeah, a bit so, of languages with unfamiliar writing systems that you have learned? Yeah. So, you know, first of all, I think the idea of, of familiar is a very important concept. I think we're all, you know, we need to deal with situations that we're familiar with. And so I knew, for example, that I would be asked to speak first because I'm the oldest. Okay, <laughs> so we're, we're used to the idea that we let older people speak first before they fall asleep. The only exception is that if there's a female present, then very often we will have the ladies speak first, but ladies don't like that anymore. In fact, we're not supposed to call them ladies anymore. But anyway, leaving all of that aside, uh, all of us have learned languages which use unfamiliar scripts. That's why we all wear glasses because we wear these glasses that change the script into a script we're more familiar with. You can buy these online at Amazon. No, seriously, I have learned, have attempted to learn, let's say 2021 20, languages. Even the languages that I was only at for a short time, like Turkish, I, I, I very much cherish the, the time that I spent learning the languages. So I just want to make the point up front that The term is sort of know a language, learn a language, study a language. None of that implies mastering a language. Very difficult to master a language. Uh, as uh, Kato Lam once famously said, language is one of the things that is worthwhile knowing even poorly. And so I'm very much in that camp because a lot of the languages I know, I know poorly. Now, dealing with a, an unfamiliar script makes it much more difficult. And that's why, for example, Turkish, which is a different language system from, say, Persian, which is an Indo-European language, actually becomes easier because it's written in the Latin alphabet. And since I have been reading the Latin alphabet, you know, ever since I was a child, I got, I don't know, millions of hours of reading. Obviously, that's always going to be easier for me, just as for someone who's used to the Cyrillic script, it'll always be easier. I firmly believe that no matter how much I read, I read, call it more or less comfortably in Chinese or Cyrillic, but it's always more comfortable to read in a script that I know. So if I look at the languages that I have learned, my top five include two with what we would call unfamiliar scripts. In other words, in order of proficiency, I speak English, French, Japanese, Mandarin, and Spanish the best. Now, two of those have unfamiliar script. So I overcame the obstacle of an unfamiliar script, and I speak those better than a number of other languages which either use the Latin script or use some other script because I've also learned languages with the Greek alphabet and the Russian, Ukrainian, which is more or less the same, and the Korean, and uh, now, of course, with uh, Persian and Arabic. So these are obstacles that can be overcome, but it does make it more difficult. So I would like to leave my opening comments at that because I don't fully understand the format here so that I'll let the other people have a few words in before I take over again. Yeah, we will have so many questions for you, Steve. Thank you so much. Uh, Emmanuel, uh, would you like to, well, we break the rule of, of the age. So Emmanuel, would you like to continue? Sorry, Richard. <laughs> Yeah, sure thing. So yeah, hi everyone. I'm Manuel. Unlike Richard and Steve here, I'm a more regular polyglot. I'm not a super hyper polyglot, poly whatever you want. Um, yeah, consider myself conversational in about 10 languages, which is, yeah, uh, yeah decent amount, uh, but nowhere near what Richard and Sierra are able to speak. Um, I have a heavy focus on Western European languages, which mostly use the Latin script, so nothing super interesting for this panel here. And my second focus is East Asian languages. Um, and yeah, as we all know, East Asian languages, so uh, Japanese, Korean, Chinese, which is uh, Chinese characters, Hangul, Kana, etc. so writing systems. 
that can be considered a familiar for um, speakers of European languages, at least, yeah, native speakers of a European language. Yeah, that's about it from my side. Thank you so much, Richard. It's your turn. Uh, For those who don't know Richard, this is Richard. I, I'm just a bit surprised that Emmanuel was actually younger than me. It's crazy. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've studied a number of languages that have different scripts. So uh, some of the ones that I've looked at, obviously, uh, Chinese, Japanese, uh, Korean at the moment, and then also Arabic, Hebrew, Greek, Armenian, Georgian, and I think I've got them all. And then the Cyrillic scripts, obviously. But my main focus in language learning has always been the Romance, Germanic, and Slavic languages. And in fact, I've gone from predominantly using the Latin script in my day-to-day, -day, sort of what I read and what I see around me, to Cyrillic. And that's the most common script really around me in here where I am in the Balkans. So it's it's quite one thing learning a script it's another thing i think also living in it on a daily basis and having to fill out all your forms having to do all of the sort of the admin work and everything else it, you don't really have the same luxury of time and um it's definitely felt different and i agree with steve as well that it can be an added layer of difficulty until you get to the point where you can visualize the script and the language in the same way as you do your original uh, way of writing. Okay, um, thank you to the three of you. So talking about this edit layer of difficulty, um, I know that there's many people who also learn a language with a different uh, script without learning the script. So how relevant is that for you, the three of you? I know we can never generalize and it also depends on different factors, but you, the three of you, how important is it for you to also learn the script? Uh, Emmanuel, would you like to start? Sure thing. Um, right, so I might have a, a little bit of a controversial opinion here because uh, from my perspective and from my experience, learning the script from the beginning is the right thing to do because uh, especially i mean for east asian languages for mandarin for example i know quite a few people who start uh, learning learning the language only based on uh, hanyu pinyin so hanyu pinyin is the romanization system for mandarin um but very early in their learning process they start uh, hitting a hurdle uh, because in chinese you realize that you have a lot of uh, homophones so words that are pronounced the same way that are written the same way when you write them in, in pinyin uh, but if you write them in chinese characters they'll be written differently and knowing which chinese characters is used to write them is the key to uh, learning that particular word so my advice to learners of languages with an unfamiliar script is yeah get started uh filing the script from the beginning uh, it's a, it's a really uh, precious asset do you agree steve and richard uh i go next i think that uh basically you want to start learning the script as early as you can and the script is a big part it depends of course on what you want to do i mean if you live in taiwan or china and you interact with shopkeepers and you have a limited sort of requirement uh, then you can do without the script Although you can't read anything, so that's a big disadvantage. Um, my, I enjoy reading. I think reading is a big part of my language learning. So obviously, if you're going to read, you got to learn the script. Um, the uh, when I learned Mandarin, we started out without the script because even if you say you have to learn the script up front, the way the Chinese script works is each you know you've got thousands of these characters to learn. So you're always going to be running the characters that you don't know. Uh, it's not an alphabet. If it's an alphabet, as you continue to read, you're getting more and more used to the, whatever it might be, 26, 44, 50 characters that you need to read. Not the case in Chinese. So obviously your, the, the opinion is helpful because you can get into listening to stuff where you don't know all the characters. And then you can always go back and get the characters. And like so much in language learning, stuff that passes you by, you can go back and get it later on. It's not like you've lost it. But in principle, I agree with Emmanuel. I would start out one character, 10 characters, 20 characters, learning a few characters. 
And I would still deal with content where there's a lot of listening of words that you can only read in pinyin as your, your brain is starting to get used to the sounds of the language, but you are at the same time on a separate track learning the characters. Um, and eventually they catch up. With regard to other scripts which are phonetic, whether they be, oh, we should say, by the way, before I was going to say this, you know, if you look at the map of the world, you'll see that the, roughly the world divides into two Latin script and non Latin script. Uh, very roughly, in terms, you know, geographically, population wise, uh, you know, the Americas, uh, Turkic languages, a good part, you know, European influence, those are all Latin script, Indonesia, Vietnam, a few out there in Asia. And then you've got the whole Chinese, Korean group that are not, and then you've got the sort of Southeast Asia, South Asia and, in, and Southeast Asia. So it's a 50 50 situation. And, and uh, scripts are either going to be higher, you know, the, the ideograms like the Chinese script, or they're going to be representing syllables, which is the case with uh, the kana in Japanese, or they're genuinely, you know, well, syllabaries are phonetic too, but like individual sounds coming together, as is the case with Hangul, uh, and obviously scripts that are kind of parallel, well, I would say they're parallel, but Greek, Cyrillic, which are not so difficult and the Arabic script, which is more difficult. So I find that when I start with the script, let's say the Arabic and Persian writing system, which was my most recent sort of different script, initially it's hard to get any kind of traction at all. You think you never will, because there's always in these older systems, there are inconsistencies. The same is true in Greek. Like it's not one sound to one symbol, uh, nor is it in English for that matter, but it is in say Spanish. Uh, and so you can then finally get a sense of what those letters do and the different forms of the letters. And so now you understand the script, but doesn't, that doesn't mean that it's comfortable for you to read in that script. And it takes a long, long time in my experience, obviously I'm not Richard Simcott, he does it overnight, uh, to get used to these scripts is very, very difficult. And you, it, it's just, you just have to keep going in my view, and just convince yourself that however much you think you're not getting anywhere, in fact, the brain is slowly getting used to it. So I'll leave it there. Having set Richard up now. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. That was uh, very interesting. And well, um, so for someone who does that overnight, um, how important is that then? Um, if you can do it overnight, is it still important or not that important? Well, I'm just wondering how Steve gets into my bedroom to listen to the cassettes I put on to describe and do it overnight. I, I'm impressed, Steve. Your, your spies are working amazingly well. Um, <laughs> seriously, though, I mean, I, I agree in part with uh, what the other two gentlemen have said. Um, and when I say in part, I mean, I agree entirely with what they're saying, but I agree with it in part as in, I think if your goal is just to go on holiday and to do some basic things with the language and the script is a huge barrier, that's where I would say, well, you could probably manage without it. Um, it probably would be such a barrier that it would be difficult. In a lot of countries as well, they will often write a transliterated version in the Latin script. So if you don't learn the original script, you do have a transliteration anyway and you probably would be able to get around. Yeah, you wouldn't read everything, but you'd be able to get around. If you're talking about simple, um, simple alphabets like Greek, for example, it's really not a huge burden to learn a language like that and a writing system like Greek. But when you get on, onto some other writing systems like Thai, like, um, I don't know, Tamil, the, the Dovanagari script, it is a little bit more challenging to master those types of scripts. So that's probably where I would, I would draw a little bit of a line between um, you know, what Emmanuel and Steve were saying and where I would sort of depart a little bit from that. Um, and just sort of, that would be, that was how I, I would preface it. The, in terms of actually learning the script, so I do think that generally speaking, if you want to get into a language properly, then you should learn the script as soon as possible. Um, because a number of times you'll see a transliterated version when you first start learning it. And if you just remember that, you'll often make mistakes in the sound reproduction when it comes to it. So um, instead of you know, getting the uh, 
sounds, you'll you'll start seeing this. Oh, it's a g with another thing next to it, and you start end up going when you're speaking. And it's it's good to be able to associate a, a picture showing a different sound that maybe doesn't exist in your language, and you can associate that in the brain a lot more easily afterwards when you're learning it properly. Okay, thank you. So basically, the three of you, you agree on on the fact that yes, or your recommendation would be to start as early as possible. Um, now, especially this uh, during the COVID and post COVID and technology that that has changed so many things, even the way we do a polyglot conference this year and last year. Um, so has technology somehow changed also well, the way we learn scripts, possibly yes, but also the importance of learning a script. Do you see any difference? And now, yes, I'm going to ask the oldest first and not <laughs> to be polite, but I, I really want to also hear your experience because how long ago um, have you started learning Japanese, uh, Steve? That was a couple of years ago, right? A couple of years ago. Uh, first of all, I want to pick on something that Richard said, which I think is very true. For me, and I'd be interested in hearing Emmanuel and Richard comment on this, but it relates to what Richard said. The image that I have of a word is the written word. So, you know, red is not the color red, image-wise, it's R-E-D. And this is true in all scripts. So even if I'm reading, say, transliterated Persian, that doesn't quite do it for me quite as well as the actual Arabic script, that word, the sound, it clicks, even though I read the Latin script better. So just to support what, what Richard said, I think it's so important to learn the script so that we get these, even if they're not one for one sound like Spanish, uh, that we get these things that we can visualize when we hear the word. That really, I think helps our learning. Insofar as technology is concerned, so I studied Chinese basically in 1968. There was no technology. There were hand, you know, flashcards that I went through and I hand wrote uh, stuff. And 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 Japanese, I learned. Uh, and you just learn it. I mean, I think the basic process of learning is the same. You just have to be exposed to them. Uh, in the case of Chinese, I wrote them all out by hand many many times, and as part of my instruction I had to write stuff in Chinese and I'm sure that helped and I think with Chinese characters it's probably a good thing to write them but nowadays we can read online click on something whatever you want to see on a character you know how to the stroke order the sound five example you know compound compound words with that character in it there's so much more information available to us uh, and and the, the with the Arabic and Persian, I haven't come across quite as much. It was uh, basically, it just comes down to very slowly with a lot of effort, getting more and more exposure into uh, to the script. But certainly for Japanese and Chinese, I have seen examples of technology that make it a lot easier uh, to learn those scripts. Yeah, I would say. Okay, thank you. The other two, any comments on that? How has technology changed that for you? Or maybe you didn't even, well, I mean, I don't know, Emmanuel, have you ever tried to uh, learn the script without technology? Or um, technology? Are uh, you native? Yes or no? Well, <laughs> I don't even know. Kind, kind of, because, uh, okay, what, I started learning Japanese about 20 years ago. Yeah, a bit less than that. It was like 2003, 2004. So back then there were no smartphones, no, um, you know, OCR technology. So you could you couldn't just use your smartphone camera and say, oh, please read that kanji for me. No, you, you had to uh, write it down yourself, um, ask someone how to read it. You could, of course, search for it on the internet. Uh, yeah, but the tools we had were very basic. Um, that has changed a lot over the last 15 years, especially over the last yeah, five years, I would say, uh, now with smartphone apps, etc. cetera. Um, all the um, apps I've been using for East Asian languages have some sort of um, built-in features that allow you um, to write those languages a bit more efficiently. And 
allow they, they they kind of allow you a, a way out when you get stuck so especially for logo graphic scripts if you don't know how to read a certain character you're gonna get stuck because um you don't know how to pronounce it so you can't really search for it the only thing you can do is draw it and on modern smartphones uh thankfully there is uh handwriting for chinese and japanese so you can just write the character the algorithms have been really improving like super fast. Now, even if you draw some gibberish, you're able to find the character. Even if you mess up the stroke order, so if you don't write the strokes the way you're supposed to write them, you'll still be able to find the character. Um, use that as an input to um, your dictionary app. And yeah, you'll be able to find the meaning of the character, how to read it, etc. cetera. Uh, same for yeah, OCR. So now you can just use your smartphone camera, um, look up some text, use any kind of dictionary app, and yeah, be able to kind of convert the image into text. And based on that text information, you'll be able to use that to, yeah, look up the text in a dictionary, things like that. So yeah, I, I would say for East Asian languages, especially yeah, especially Chinese and Japanese, that would be the two things that have completely changed my experience in terms of language learning. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we have a question here also from Ella, and Ella says, uh, what about learning to read the script versus learning to write the script? Do you do one before the other? Richard, how is that for you? Do you do it at the same time or do you focus first on reading? I mean, often they, they go hand in hand. I would tend to use a book for this kind of thing. So even though the apps are there um, and I get like the Chinese, it might be a bit different, but for, um, for Korean, for example, uh, it's not particularly challenging to go through the Korean alphabet and to learn it. Uh, but I found Judith Meyer's book actually cracking sort of um, the, funda cracking the fundamentals of, um, of the Korean script script hacking guide it's called is, is is actually a really good way of, of of going through it i like the types of examples of words that you already know so words that are international words places things that have been adopted into the korean language i found really easy to start learning them because i i didn't need to memorize the word in addition to the the new letters or characters, whichever you're, you're, you're learning, you, you just focus on, um, on, on actually reproducing, reading, understanding, recognizing um, the, the words that you already know in the language. And in fact, even this week, we've been doing um, a Georgian course, and this, today was day two, we're doing it all the way through um, the conference. And the teacher uh, has, Ekaterina, has also been using this this technique with the with the group, getting us to write our names, writing them out, showing us how they'd be adapted into Georgian, how the sounds would slightly change, and which letters you would use. And I just find that kind of thing is is a really good approach to getting started in learning uh, a new way of writing. Okay, and Steve, the one who always um well tells us that reading is the key uh, same for you does it go hand in hand or do you focus first on reading or what would you recommend um it's hard to say what i would recommend uh when i was learning chinese uh we had to write and i was in a class like i, I was 1968 i was sent to learn chinese by the canadian government they were paying me it was my full-time job i wrote and i wrote lots and i'm sure that helped me learn the characters so I think writing is a good thing to do. Since then, I've never been in a situation where I needed to write. So I lived in Japan for nine years, did business in Japanese, did everything I wanted to do in Japanese, never wrote Japanese, can't write Japanese, period. Um, I don't write, I can't write Cyrillic, I can't write Greek, I can't write uh, uh, Arabic, Persian. I don't do it, I learn. My motivation is the content that I can access. So again, for that same reason, I'm not tremendously motivated, although I tried it, you know, to, to read familiar things like place names in Arabic as a shortcut to learning Arabic. I would rather struggle with content that might be 
of interest to me, or at least has a lot of repetition in it so that I'm gaining words. And my motivation, my strategy is always now that I'm no longer in a class learning Mandarin, being paid by someone else with an obligation to achieve something. Now that I can do whatever I want, um, I don't bother writing. Uh, I can write in all these languages online. I can cheat. I can even dictate in, I haven't tried it yet for Arabic. I'm sure it'll work. But in Greek, um, I can just speak at the iPhone and out comes Greek. Uh, I can do the same if I want to write in French and I don't want to worry about accents uh, or Spanish. I just speak at the iPhone and out it comes. Uh, Russian, Ukrainian, you name it. So that's a, a bit of a cheat thing. But I, I just enjoy enjoying languages, enjoy listening, enjoy watching whatever I can do. And so I, I have never I, I have this thing that I, I want to get more words, more words. And so if I sit down and I start writing a whole bunch of stuff, uh, it's just going to slow me down in terms of acquiring more words. So that's the dilettante approach. But the person who is very thorough and, and you know, wants to nail the language, it may very well be that people who, who have the more thorough approach who actually write, they might, in fact, learn to read faster. I don't know. I've never tried it. I can only say that in my own experience, including when I lived in Japan, did business in Japan every day, read the newspaper, and Nihon Keiza Shimbun, whatever, but I never wrote. Maybe I should. Maybe I, if I wrote more, I'd be younger. <laughs> well, Steve, I think you are uh, very fit and, and very young, and I think we all admire you for that. But um, we also have a question here from uh, Ron, and that question is for Emmanuel at this time. So sure. Ron asks basically if um, for communication, for example, via WeChat, um, if it is uh, useful or if you would recommend to uh no being in if that yeah yeah i just read the the question ron uh yeah thank you so um yeah you mentioned that so that is basically you know how to type characters uh and mine says yes so um when it comes to chinese or japanese so it's very helpful to know how to write characters because knowing how to write them will help you understand their structure but obviously uh when you type a, a message in mandarin you want to check you know, with your friends or using any kind of messaging app, you're not going to write each character individually. Well, you can, but that's not the way Chinese or Japanese people do that. So you're going to write it uh, yeah, using any kind of input system, it can be Pinyin, it can be Juin, so Bopomofo, that's what they use in Taiwan, or Kana in, in Japan, usually. So you can type the Kana directly uh, using a smartphone, or Romaji uh, for Japanese again, um, so yeah, knowing, like generally speaking, knowing how to input characters on a smartphone or on a computer is very helpful, of course. I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, so actually we do have many questions. Uh, also, I've received here in the question button um, two more questions. But I would like also to take the time also for a short, well, summary or to, to sum it up from each of the, the panelists. Um, I would like to uh, invite everyone because we recorded this panel discussion and Richard is going to upload this to the Saturn Theater. So you can also watch it and you can also leave your questions there and then maybe um, if the panelists uh, also have a look and like if they go to the Saturn Theater, then they might also see your questions and can maybe even do a video about this or whatever they want to do without it, uh, with it, I mean. Okay, so my last question would be for everyone, um, what is your recommendation for people who want to learn a language uh, with a writing system that is unfamiliar to, to them? To them? Also, we had one of the questions here about uh, dictionaries or apps. Maybe you can also include some of the resources that you have used um, into your final recommendation. Um, maybe let's start. Well, we do the same order. <laughs> Steve, would you like to start? Yeah, so. Uh, you know, I, th I think the uh, it's it's not a good idea to to rely too much on the the Romanized version because the Romanized versions can be 
have a lot of problems. Uh, opinion, very, you have to get used to the fact that Q is not pronounced K, it's pronounced CH, and X is pronounced SH. There's all kinds of stuff in there. The Korean romanization is essentially unusable, makes absolutely no sense at all. I can't use it. If I see it, I just, so I just learned the Hangul because the EU is pronounced, I don't know what it's pronounced, like it's just full of stuff like that. Uh, the Japanese try to be, you know, like ta, Hachitsu, Tetsu, or whatever, they, they, you know, you, you end up with the word for honey, which is Hachimitsu, it comes out Hachimitu, because they're trying to be, you know, consistent with their kana system. So as quickly as possible, you drop the phonetic and occasionally go there when you're stuck. Um, so far as technology, since I've, I haven't, I don't have the, uh, the advantage of learning Chinese or Japanese today, I don't know all of the different dictionary uh, apps that are available. Uh, I shouldn't, you know, if you're on link and you, you'll see a range of dictionaries for those languages, you can check out all those dictionaries. You don't have to be a member to do that. And you'll see that we have like five or six or more dictionaries for each of those languages. And you can go to those dictionary sites and get those dictionaries. There are lots of really good dictionaries for Asian languages. Uh, Persian dictionaries are not very good. Uh, Korean dictionaries I haven't been very satisfied with. Um, Arabic, uh, one really good dictionary in not so much just script, but in general is Reverso, both the, uh, for the meaning and also for uh, conjugation. Uh, it's a very good dictionary. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Explore or explore, like look up dictionaries. Like people should use Google in many ways, because if you Google, you're going to find all kinds of resources. Even if you Google dictionary or you Google a point of grammar or you Google whatever you Google, you'll find lots of different resources that are promoting their apps or whatever. And many of them are very good. OK, thank you. Uh, Emmanuel, what's your uh, recommendation, last recommendation, or also if you want to share uh, resources that you have used that might be helpful. Absolutely. So yeah, uh, to add to what Steve just said. So um, yeah, for East Asian languages, I have quite a few uh, tools to recommend. So for Japanese, uh, you can use jisho.org on uh, a computer or an app called Japanese or Nihongo. Um, if you type either in the App Store, you'll be able to find it. Uh, for Mandarin, there's an excellent app called Pleco uh, with tons of plugins, including some to help you learn Chinese characters using their etymology. Uh, you can use MDBG on the desktop. And for Korean, uh, you can use the Naver dictionary, uh, yeah, both available on the desktop and on a mobile. And if you're learning multiple Asian languages at the same time, I can actually recommend you uh, <laughs> the tool I developed called CJKV Dict. Uh, so yeah, it's available as a website uh, for the App Store uh, for iOS and on the Google Play Store for Android. And basically, whenever you type a word in any East Asian language, it can be Chinese, Japanese, Korean, or even Vietnamese, um, if that word exists in another of these languages, it will automatically be converted to traditional Chinese characters. And then we will show you, yeah, if that word exists in the other languages and what it means, because sometimes it doesn't mean exactly the same thing. Uh, you, you have quite a bit of, uh, quite a few uh, false friends in East Asian languages. So one example is tegami in Japanese, which means letter. So it's a paper you hold in your hand. Te means hand and kami means letter. And in Chinese, shouju means toilet paper. It's also a type of you know paper that you can hold in your hand, but it doesn't mean exactly the same thing. So, yeah, that would be my recommendations. Thank you for that example. That was brilliant. <laughs> um, Richard, what is your very last recommendation? Maybe also with the focus on someone who is living in a country with a script different to the one that you were used to in your home country. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I think I could also mention that if you're using something like the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, as well in conjunction with learning a new script, um, Glossica produces a number of materials where they use side by side um, the script, 
and the IPA, um, which can help with the recording as well. So you've got things like that that you can do to do some sentence training. Um, in addition to obviously all of the other things that have been mentioned and the, the script hacking that I mentioned that um, Judith Meyer um, put together. There is one thing I do want to touch on though before we finish, and that is that there is a written style of diglossia in some languages when it comes to uh, the writing system. So you could learn, for example, how Hebrew is written and you could see it in the Torah, but then when you see it written, handwritten, it looks like a completely different language. Um, there's a similar thing that happens with uh, the Cyrillic alphabet. So I mean, most people, when they're learning the Cyrillic alphabet, they sort of wince when they get to the cursive section where like, oh, why is the D turned to a G? And why is all this, not what's happening with this nonsense? And it is something you see and you see it quite a lot. The cursive will be used in a non-cursive way. And that's something that I had to get used to uh, where I do see the Cyrillic used in, in the two different ways. And some languages, it's even more um, difficult to sort of navigate those waters. And I think Chinese, especially if you ever go to a Chinese restaurant and you see how they, how they just scribble <laughs> the characters down, compared to what you see in a book, there's quite a change in sort of how you do it. So uh, bear in mind that there can be that kind of difference where, you know, whereas other languages, pretty much it's what you see in the printed word is what you get when you see it written down. But yeah. All right. Well, um, I just, uh, well, I was observing the, the chat here a little bit, and there's also some uh, recommendations here from uh, our community, from the ones watching this panel. So thank you so much for sharing that too. And yeah, um, especially a huge thank you to our panelists. Um, I think this topic, um, well, Steve, uh, it was Steve's idea, to be honest, the topic. <laughs> So thank you very much. I think it was a very important part of the Polyglot Conference to have something um, like this as a panel discussion. Um, thank you so much for your time, dear panelists. And yeah, we see you all very soon and hopefully also very soon again in person. Thank you very much. Thank everyone. you. I hope so too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.